between the cries of an infant with a hair tourniquet wrapped around the head of his penis and the psychotic deliberations of a patient high on meth, finding time to relieve my screaming bladder can be viewed as something of a privilege for an ER physician. <laughs> no relief was in sight when the man arrived gripping his chest. Rivulets of cold sweat poured from his shaved head. The paramedic handed me his EKG as they rolled him by under gurney. An EKG is something of a minor miracle, a convergence of technology, ink, and paper that opens a window into the mysterious electrical circuitry of the heart. When heart mus muscle cells die, their electrical pattern changes. I examined the man's undulating heart waves. The classic signs of a heart attack jumped off the strip of paper and slapped me across the face. It rang the bells in my ear, drowning the wail of my irritable bladder. I imagine a clot sitting in the biggest, most important artery of his heart, depriving it of oxygen. This blood vessel we call the Widowmaker. The emergency room was abuzz with something that can only be described as organized chaos. Paramedics rattled off a report while a nurse scribbled the man's medical history on a piece of paper. Enrico, an EMT, was charged with hooking the man up to the heart monitor. He removed the man's shoes and slid off his jeans. The cardiac team arrived and shaved the thick brown hair around his groin, preparing him for what was to come. Marcus, an African-American nurse, cradled the white man's limp arm in preparation for inserting an IV. With arms side by side, their black and white skin reminded me of the yin and yang. I analyzed the man's vital signs flashing on the monitor above his head. His blood pressure and oxygen levels were plummeting. A contagion that started in his heart had spread to his lungs. His eyes wore a look of resignation. He was too weak and too breathless to talk. So I placed a stethoscope to his chest and listened to what his heart had to say. The thump, the thump, the thump. Enrico brandished a pair of trauma shears from its holster, wielding them like a samurai sword. He sliced the man's drenched shirt down the middle and peeled it off. The swastika sat defiant on the man's chest. A bead of sweat slid across its glistening surface. The white lights above the man's head bounced off the swastika tattoo and it shone like a mirror, blinding and intoxicating in a way that made everyone want to turn their eyes away, but couldn't. The swastika had the allure of Medusa, but instead of turning to stone, I returned to being the seven-year-old kid who stepped nervously onto the tarmac of Limburg Field in 1981. A journey that brought me and my family from Saigon to San Diego. I clung to my mother's hand, searching for familiar faces, only to find the unfamiliar among the taller Americans with their golden hair and fancy clothes. I understood what a difference 8,500 miles made. I was taking ESL classes, and while the other kids were reading Little House on the Prairie, I was struggling with, if you give a mouse a cookie. I was 13, riding my bike home from school when a nameless, faceless stranger screamed out of a passing car, go home, gook. And there it was, as plain as the swastika on the man's chest, the pain of not belonging. I searched for it on the faces of Marcus and Enrico, for wounds left behind by a symbol that deemed Marcus as less an ER nurse than a gay black man, a symbol that condemned Enrico for daring to cross the Mexican border with his band of criminals and rapists. So the faceless stranger in the passing car had a face. It was the face of a man with a shaved head and a swastika tattoo. But there was no venom in his eyes. His skin no longer burned red hot, but was a cool ashen gray. The skinhead was less a target of my revulsion than a patient that had to be saved. He stopped breathing. 
I probed his neck for a pulse, but found none. Enrico jumped on his chest and started compressions. The snap of broken ribs testified to the strength of his conviction. Marcus charged the defibrillator pads before handing me the paddles. I placed them on the man's chest, covering the swastika. I delivered a jolt of electricity strong enough to lift the man's body off the bed, strong enough to convince his heart to end its slumber. The man's eyes fluttered like the raising of Lazarus. Then, a collective sigh of relief. The man was transferred to the cardiac lab. His destiny rested in the hands of the Persian cardiologist who understood the language of the heart just as fluently as she could recite Arabic poetry in her native tongue. She inserted a catheter through the femoral artery in the man's groin and snaked it into his heart. She interrogated its blood vessels and removed the clot. The cardiologist soothed the spastic widow maker with a stent and a whisper, shh. The man recovered and left the hospital two days later. I didn't visit him in the ICU. What more did I have to say to a man after zapping him with 200 joules of electricity? I doubted he'd even recognize me. One of the great ironies of emergency medicine is that those who need you the most are the least likely to remember who you are. but I yearned for something more. It wasn't enough that a man was still alive. I needed to know that his swastika didn't survive. I've thought about what I would say if we ever meet again, all the different scenarios swirling in my head. In my most hopeful imaginings, the man with the tattoo knocks on my door and I invite him in. We sit on my kitchen table, and I offer him a cup of Vietnamese drip coffee. He insists on having it black, but I assure him it's better with sweetened condensed milk. He stirs the thick white cream which sits at the bottom of the warm, dark liquid, the clang of metal spoon to glass like church bells before Sunday mass. He takes a sip of the roasted caramelized concoction and nods in approval, a rebuke of the notion of a comfort zone. I tell him about my family. After the fall of Saigon, my father hid in the jungle for four years. The North was intent on re-educating the South. He was the first to escape on a boat and landed in a refugee camp in Indonesia. My three older siblings went after him, and they miraculously reunited with my dad in the same camp about a year later. After immigration papers, they jumped on a plane and flew to America in 1980. My mom, younger and older sister and I, were the last to escape. Our boat ran out of water and fuel. We drifted aimlessly in the vast South China Sea. 93 sweaty bodies folded in a boat half the size of this room, like a game of human Tetris. After five days, we were rescued by a French fishing, fishing vessel, which just happened to be passing by. I remember standing on the deck of the ship while they sank a wooden bolt with a wooden pole. We were dropped off in a refugee camp in Hong Kong. My father sent letters from America in a small care package, which included a six pack of Snickers bars. For a Vietnamese kid who'd never tasted chocolate before, imagine my delight. <laughs> this magical combination of caramel, peanuts, and nougat covered in milk chocolate. My mom had to make six Snickers bars last, so she'd break off a piece, mash it in a cup of hot water and powdered milk for me and my sister to share. I want the man with the tattoo to smile and say, I give Snickers bars away for Halloween. 
full-sized ones. <laughs> and we both chuckle the way grown men do stumbling upon a shared truth. Snickers satisfies. <laughs> My parents cleaned homes for white people who lived in neighborhoods called Talmadge in Kensington. My dad received an associate's degree in engineering at Miramar College. He worked for NASCO and spent the better part of 30 years hammering and bending sheet metal to help build Navy ships. He's retired now and lives off of Social Security in a lifetime supply of hearing aids paid for by his former employer. My mom went to cosmetology school to be a hairstylist. If the American dream for a Vietnamese woman can be distilled into two words, it would be hair salon. <laughs> she studied from the English textbooks which were foreign to her. I don't know if this is true, but it has been rumored that my dad snuck into her class one time and took an exam for her. <laughs> and he aced it. My mom has been doing hair and nail for almost 40 years, and most of her clientele were old white ladies. If you wanted a perm from a Vietnamese woman and didn't care that she may or may not have cheated on her exams, <laughs> then you found a friend for life. <laughs> she used to host Christmas parties for her clients <laughs> and their families. They were as loyal to my mom as she was to them. Now she volunteers at Pomerado Hospital. As for me and my siblings, one is a business owner, another a math teacher, another a nurse, one works in finance for some douchey tech company, <laughs> and two are physicians. I asked the man, how did my family make it in America? He says it's a story of resilience and a strong immigrant work, ethic, work ethic. I tell him that sounds romantic, but it's not even half of it. Ours is a story of opportunity and connection. The first couple of years in America, we rode the back of America's welfare system. Food stamps stocked our cupboards. Medi-Cal kept us healthy. A visionary UC school system that prioritized giving opportunities for low-income kids by way of Pell Grants and financial aid a system funded by tax-paying Americans like him, the same Americans with their golden hair and fancy clothes. I wait for my friend to say something, but he sits and watches the coffee swirl as he stirs. I ask, back in the hospital, did we succeed? Did we remove the hate from your heart? I want him to say, over time, the hate fades like a cheap prison tattoo, and what's left is resentment. Resentment of a country that has ignored a struggling white lower class, a demographic that spans from the Appalachian Mountains to the Valley of El Cajon. World War II and the Great Depression produced the silent generation. Our current generation is silenced by overdose and suicide. It has overtaken car accidents as the number one cause of death in young people. Percocets over purpose. Guns over gumption. Of all the opioid-related deaths, 70% are white Americans. Over half are low income. How many died without opportunity and purpose? How many died with Wi-Fi as their only connection? I see an America that has worked for people like me. My friend sees an America that isn't working for people like him. An ocean of silence stands between us as we let the sweet and the bitter linger on our tongues. We allow the other's perspective to pierce the wall of our consciousness like the sting of a cold salve on an open wound. Then we chuckle again at an America we both love but is imperfect. Back in the emergency room, when a man with a tattoo was dying 
and the people around him were tasked with rescuing him, a symbol threatened to disconnect them. It was a shared humanity that saved them. Thank you. Jay Vu, ladies and gentlemen, Jay Vu.